Hello from SNN Sports. This is Andrew from KLP Entertainment and here is the NFL Week 2 Recap. Week 2 of the NFL season began Thursday night with a Buffalo Bills blowout win over the Miami Dolphins. Dolphins quarterback Tua Tagovailoa left the game in the third quarter with a concussion. On Sunday, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers tamed the Detroit Lions, and the New Orleans Saints offense proved to be too much for the Dallas Cowboys. Packers quarterback Malik Willis helped lead Green Bay to its first win of the season, while the Lamar Jackson-led Baltimore Ravens fell to the Las Vegas Raiders. The Arizona Cardinals' 31-point win over the Los Angeles Rams was spearheaded by big performances from quarterback Kyler Murray and rookie wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. Sunday night featured the Houston Texans blitzing their way to a victory over Caleb Williams and the Chicago Bears. Monday night's Week 2 finale featured the Atlanta Falcons rallying to take down the Philadelphia Eagles. Our NFL Nation reporters reacted to all the action, answering lingering questions coming out of each game and detailing everything else you need to know for every team. Let's get to it. Can the Falcons' offense figure things out for four quarters? For the second straight week, the Falcons played well on defense. But the offense faltered until the final drive. Atlanta has just three touchdowns in eight quarters. Quarterback Kirk Cousins did not appear to be back in form after a torn right Achilles ended his 2023 season until his game-saving performance with 139 left. The Falcons host the Kansas City Chiefs next week, followed by two huge division games against the New Orleans Saints and Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Eye-popping stat, Cousins has six go-ahead pass touchdowns in the final minute of regulation or overtime since becoming a full-time starter in 2015. Only one quarterback has more during that period of time, Derek Carr, with eight. That's a good reminder of who the Falcons paid $100 million guaranteed for. Describe the game in two words, tremendous save. The Falcons were on the verge of going down 0-2 with the Chiefs coming to town in Week 3. Cousins, with the help of his receivers, managed to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat in what was as close to a must-win game there could be in Week 2. Mark Raimondi next game, versus Chiefs, Sunday, 8.20 p.m. Eastern Time, can the Eagles rebound from this gut punch loss? Following a 1-6 collapse, the question entering this season is how the Eagles would deal with adversity when it inevitably hit. They'll get that test early after blowing a late lead to Atlanta. They will have to get by with A.J. Brown for at least one more game. Brown told ESPN reporter Lisa Salters he expects to miss a couple of weeks with his injured hamstring. Describe the game in two words, brutal loss. The win was in the Eagles' hands before Atlanta ripped it away with a six-play, 70-yard drive in the closing moments. A last-ditch effort by the Eagles' offense ended in a Jalen Hurts interception. Eye-popping stat, Cousins was pressured on just two of 14 dropbacks, 14%, in the first half, the lowest rate he's faced in any half since week one of 2023. Tim McManus next game, at Saints, Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, how can the Texans get all three receivers involved? The Texans have a dynamic receiving trio of Stefan Diggs, Tank Dell, and Nico Collins. While Collins had his second consecutive 100-yard game, 135, Dell and Diggs combined for 30 yards. That's been the theme through two weeks. Diggs has two touchdowns in 2024 but 70 yards receiving. Dell hasn't made many plays either, totaling 33 receiving yards. Offensive coordinator Bobby Slowick must figure out how to get other playmakers involved to reach their potential. Biggest hole in the game plan, Slowick strayed from a balanced offense. C.J. Stroud dropped back 39 times but Slowick called 21 rushing plays for 76 yards. The Texans had success running the ball in Week 1 as Joe Mixon reached 159 rushing yards on 30 carries against the Colts. Mixon was battling an ankle injury Sunday. Eye-popping advanced stat, cornerback Derek Stingley Jr. guarded Bears receiver DJ Moore on 28 routes and allowed 52 yards while snagging an interception. Stingley followed Moore for the majority of the game. DJ Bienam next game, at Vikings, Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, how can the offense better support Caleb Williams? At times, the number one pick looked better in his second outing, two of his best passes came on Chicago's lone scoring drive and were negated by a penalty and a drop by W.R. Romo Duns. Williams finished 23 of 37 for 174 yards, no touchdowns, two interceptions and a 51.0 passer rating. 
The Bears had no answer to Houston's blitz and failed to protect Williams, who was sacked seven times. After going 0-4-5 under pressure against the Titans, Williams was 2 of 9 for 20 yards with two interceptions while pressured against Houston. Describe the game in two words, costly mistakes. Chicago's nine penalties, including three on special teams, put the offense behind the chains. And two of those came on the offensive line for false starts after timeouts. Matt Eberfluss threw two questionable challenge flags, and Williams forced a throw into coverage that resulted in his second interception. Biggest hole in the game plan, Chicago's run game was non-existent for a second straight week. DeAndre Swift totaled 18 yards on 14 rushes, 1.3 yards per carry. Williams scrambling, 44 yards, accounted for most of the damage on a night when play design and poor run blocking made the Bears one-dimensional offensively. Courtney Cronin next game, at Colts, Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, what has happened to tight end Travis Kelsey? Kelsey has disappeared from the passing game. He had just one catch for five yards after a three-catch, 34-yard performance last week against the Ravens. The Chiefs are deeper at wide receiver than they have been in recent years and have receiving alternatives at tight end in Noah Gray and Jared Wiley, so they don't consistently need big production from Kelsey every week. But it's difficult to see them being as dynamic offensively without getting more from Kelsey. Biggest hole in the game plan, quarterback Patrick Mahomes threw just 13 passes in the first half as the Chiefs attempted 18 running plays. They were mostly productive but generated just 10 first-half points. The Chiefs need their running game to help take some pressure off Mahomes in the passing attack, but when they are out of balance like this, they're not maximizing their return from their best player. Most surprising performance, Mahomes. He threw a pair of interceptions and had a third called back because of a Bengals penalty. Mahomes tried but failed to get a big play downfield other than a 44-yard touchdown pass to wide receiver Rassie Rice. Otherwise, the Chiefs had no pass play of more than 16 yards. Adam Tyker. Next game, at Falcons, Sunday, 8.20 p.m. Eastern Time, what does this performance say about QB Joe Burrow's wrist? Cincinnati couldn't have asked for a more encouraging showing from Burrow. After the downfield passing attack was absent toward the end of training camp and in the season opener, Burrow was more willing to push the ball deep. He also embraced contact without any reservations, which led to some important gains, and also a fumble that was returned for a touchdown. But the outing bodes well for Burrow as he continues to come back from the right wrist injury that ended his previous season. Describe the game in two words, another classic. It looked like the Bengals were on the brink of pulling out an unlikely victory despite being 6.5-point underdogs. But a late penalty by rookie Dijon Anthony on 4th and 16 put Kansas City in position for the winning field goal. Eye-popping advanced stat, Burrow had an average of 2.88 seconds to throw against Kansas City, per NFL Next Gen stats. Cincinnati's offensive line deserves a ton of credit for giving Burrow ample time in the pocket. Ben Baby next game, versus Commanders, Monday, 8.15 p.m. Eastern Time, defense has given up 16 points this season, the fewest points it has allowed through the first two weeks since 2007. But the second-half defensive performance didn't quite match up with the first half, when the Steelers held the Broncos to 62 total yards and 29 passing yards. The Broncos found second-half success with Bo Nix in the pass game and moved the ball through chunk plays. But the defense still came up with timely plays as Corey Trice Jr. hauled in an interception after back-to-back -back pass plays of 26 and 49 yards. With the Chargers coming to Pittsburgh in Week 3, the Steelers will face their biggest challenge to date. Early prediction for next week, QB Justin Fields starts against in the Steelers' home opener. Though Fields had an uneven performance, he played well enough for the Steelers to continue to be cautious with Russell Wilson's calf injury. Fields completed 10 of 12 attempts for 101 yards and a touchdown pass his first as a Steeler in the first half. Describe the game in two words, inconsistent offense. The Steelers followed the game plan to near perfection save for a slew of offensive line penalties in the first half by dominating the time of possession, making smart throws and getting strong running back play. They entered the break with a 10-0 lead and converted four of six third downs. It didn't continue in the second half. Penalties put the offense behind the chains and the Steelers failed to sustain drives. What can the Broncos do on offense to help QB Bo Nix? 
The Broncos had three first downs and 62 yards at halftime, Knicks had 39 yards passing midway through the third quarter and the Denver offense couldn't provide much en route to a 0-2 start. For the second consecutive week, coach Sean Payton kept the offense in a bevy of three WR sets and didn't utilize the run game much, only seven rushes in the first half. The only life the Broncos' offense showed was on a 49-yard trick play between Knicks and Josh Reynolds in the third quarter, but Knicks threw an interception in the end zone one play later. Denver might need to play out of bulkier personnel groupings and grind it out until Knicks finds his footing. Early prediction for next week, the Buccaneers' pass rush will come after Knicks. The league's schedule maker did Knicks no favors, with his first four games coming against head coaches with long, productive defensive resumes. Mike McDonald, Seahawks, and Mike Tomlin, Steelers, have held the Broncos to 26 points in two games, and now Tampa Bay's Todd Bowles lurks in Week 3. Bowles routinely attacks opposing quarterbacks, and it would be surprising if he didn't send regular pressure at Knicks. Most surprising performance, cornerback Pat Certain too. It was more shocking than surprising, but Certain might have had his most difficult day as a pro. He had two holding penalties, one on special teams and a pass interference penalty. He also surrendered a third down catch to George Pickens in the first half. It was uncharacteristic for Certain, who has been the Broncos' most consistent, impactful player since entering the NFL in 2021. Is this what the Cardinals' offense can look like every week? It sure looks like it. Take what Arizona did in Buffalo in Week 1 and compound that with the showing Sunday against the Rams, in which the Cardinals put up 41 points and 489 yards while featuring a 100-yard receiver in Marvin Harrison Jr. and 100-yard rusher in James Conner. The Cardinals are averaging 34.5 points per game and 374 yards in their two games. Describe the game in two words, rookie breakout. The Cardinals' rookie wide receiver followed a one-catch performance in his NFL debut with 130 yards and two touchdowns in the first quarter of his first home game. Both of his scores were electric, showcasing his versatility with a toe-drag catch in the back of the end zone as well as one that ended with him outrunning a defensive back for a diving touchdown. Early prediction for next week, Harrison will do it again against the Lions in the second of three straight home games, but he will be used more throughout the game. What will the passing offense look like if W.R. Cooper Cup misses time with his ankle injury? The Rams' depth at the position is already being tested with wide receiver Puka Nakua going on injured reserve with a knee injury. If Cup misses time and Los Angeles doesn't add to the room, the Rams will rely on a top three receiving core of Demarcus Robinson, Tyler Johnson, and either Tutu Atwell or rookie sixth-round pick Jordan Whittington. Quarterback Matthew Stafford and the offense struggled to move the ball against the Cardinals, finishing with 245 total yards. Biggest hole in the game plan, a week after the Lions ran the ball seven times to go the length of the field for the overtime win, the Rams' defense struggled to stop the run against Arizona. The Cardinals ran with ease, finishing with 231 yards, including 59 yards on five carries for quarterback Kyler Murray. Most surprising performance, running back Karen Williams. While the Cardinals ran all over the field, the Rams did not. Williams scored a touchdown late in the third quarter, but the Rams struggled to move the ball on the ground for most of the game. Williams ran for 25 yards on 12 carries. His average of 2.1 yards per carry Sunday is his lowest mark in a game since becoming the starter last season. So this is what the offense is supposed to look like? After an anemic six-plus quarters of football the Raiders had only 48 yards of offense at halftime and Baltimore quarterback Gardner Minshew, wide receiver Devontae Adams and company came to life. Trailing by 10 points with 12 minutes to play, Las Vegas became a juggernaut as Adams finished with 9 catches for 110 yards and a touchdown. The offense's awakening gave the defense a breather and complimentary football led to the win. Biggest hole in the game plan, the Raiders forgot to pack their running game on offense. Or did you miss Las Vegas rushing for 4 yards in the first half? Offensive coordinator Luke Getze authored the NFL's top-ranked rushing attack in 2022 for the Bears and was number two last season. What gives? Most surprising performance, defensive end Max Crosby. When he wasn't in Ravens QB Lamar Jackson's face he sacked the elusive QB twice the talkative Raiders edge rusher was in Jackson's ear. And for good reason. 
After Jackson ran for 122 yards and seven first downs during the Ravens' season opening loss at Kansas City, Crosby helped limit Jackson to just 20 yards on the ground. Can the Ravens rebound from an 0-2 start? This is essentially uncharted territory for the Ravens. The only time Baltimore has started 0-2 in coach John Harbaugh's previous 16 seasons was in 2015, when the team finished with its worst record under him, 5-11. After failing to hold a 10-point lead against the Raiders with 12 minutes remaining Sunday, Baltimore has dug itself in a hole. The Ravens' next three games are against two defending division champions at Dallas and home against Buffalo and at Cincinnati. QB Lamar Jackson has work to do to get Baltimore back on track as one of the top Super Bowl contenders. Describe the game in two words, another collapse. This marks the Ravens' fourth loss after leading by double digits in the fourth quarter since 2022. This ties the Bears for the most in the NFL in that span, according to ESPN Research. The Ravens can blame only themselves for that fourth quarter collapse. A false start by running back Derrick Henry on the Ravens' version of the tush push stopped Baltimore from converting a third and one. A pass interference penalty by cornerback Brandon Stevens set up the Raiders' game tying touchdown. Eye-popping advanced stat, Justin Tucker, the most accurate kicker in NFL history, is having trouble with longer kicks. Tucker, 34, missed wide left from 56 yards, which makes him 147 from 50 yards over the past two seasons. He had been one of the best from distance. In his first 11 seasons, Tucker's 57 field goals from 50 yards or longer ranked second over that span. Is this closer to what the Browns' new offense wants to be? The Browns' offense wasn't perfect by any means, but it put forth a much better effort than its week one no-show. Cleveland ran the ball well and frequently brought in extra linemen to get the ground game going. Penalties continued to be an issue, but the Browns got cleaner play from quarterback Deshaun Watson, who didn't turn the ball over and rushed for a touchdown in the first quarter. Describe the game in two words, undisciplined football. After the Browns were flagged for 11 accepted penalties in Week 1, they committed 13 penalties that were accepted Sunday. They were especially undisciplined late, with three infractions negating a potential game-sealing touchdown drive and giving the ball back to the Jaguars. Early prediction for next week, the Browns' offense will break out against the Giants. The unit wasn't great against Jacksonville but showed signs of life in the first half. The Browns could finally get one or both of their top tackles back next week in Jedrick Wills Jr. and Jack Conklin, which could help jumpstart the unit. Can the Jaguars salvage September? After an 0-2 start, they still have road games at Buffalo next Monday night and at Houston the following week. Only one team has made the playoffs after an 0-4 start, the 1992 San Diego Chargers. This team has to overcome some major issues, starting with an offense that was missing for nearly three quarters against the Browns. Owner Shed Khan said before the season that the time to win is now, and missing the playoffs puts the potential for changes on the table. Biggest hole in the game plan, losing tight end Evan Engram in pregame warm-ups to a hamstring injury forced the Jaguars to adjust their game plan less than two hours before kickoff. Second-year player Brenton Strange got more work but Engram is a major part of the offense, especially when the Jaguars want to execute short, quick throws to essentially function as part of the run game or slow down the pass rush. There isn't another tight end on the roster who can do what Engram does, though Strange did step up in the intermediate pass game with three receptions for 65 yards. Early prediction for next week, rookie receiver Brian Thomas Jr. will become a bigger part of the offense. He delivered a big play for the second week in a row catching a 66-yard pass on a post pattern to set the Jaguars up inside the 10-yard line for their only touchdown. He had only four targets last week and three this week, but he's averaging 22.6 yards on his five catches. Did Washington discover its run game? Quarterback Jaden Daniels needs more help, and the run game provided it Sunday. Running back Brian Robinson Jr. had the two longest runs of his career, 32 and 40 yards, on route to 133 yards. His power inside made a big difference, and Austin Ekeler's contributions in the pass game fueled the offense. Ekeler caught three passes for 47 yards and ran eight times for 38 more. Washington needs to find its identity and lacks firepower in the pass game, but if the run game produces it can at least control the game and limit the defense's time on the field.
described the game in two words, ugly win. But it sure beats a pretty loss for a group that's trying to rebuild the franchise. Daniels was sacked five times but led a game-winning drive thanks to a 34-yard pass and 14-yard run that was capped by Austin Seibert's seventh field goal. Biggest hole in the game plan, Washington's coverage plan for Malik Neighbors. Washington used backup Mike Davis against the Giants rookie for the first half and it did not go well as Neighbors caught five passes for 73 yards. The commanders kept playing man against Neighbors in key spots, and he'd beat them on crossers. Is this finally a step in the right direction for QB Daniel Jones? It's hard to tell. Why? Jones always seems to play well against Washington. He threw a pair of touchdown passes Sunday and now has 12 TD tosses and three interceptions against the Commanders in his career. Jones continued the trend by playing well in this matchup, making good plays even late in the fourth quarter. It had to be good for his confidence. That's huge considering it was a concern entering week two. Biggest hole in the game plan, the Giants didn't have a kicker. Yes, that really happened. They couldn't even try to kick a field goal to take the lead with just over two minutes remaining because Graham Gano pulled his hamstring chasing down the opening kickoff. The problem was that the Giants knew Gano was already hurt entering Sunday, they added him to the injury report Saturday with a groin problem, and didn't leave themselves with a contingency. Most surprising performance, wide receiver Malik Neighbors. It's not that surprising that the number six draft pick is playing well, but what is surprising is his 18 targets the most for a rookie since Rams receiver Puka Naku was 20 in week two last season. Neighbors wasn't just part of the game plan, he was the game plan for the Giants. He finished with 10 catches for 127 yards and his first career touchdown. Only problem is that his fourth down drop with just over two minutes remaining deep in Washington territory was costly. Is QB Geno Smith one of the NFL's most clutch quarterbacks? Smith routinely came through in crunch time last season, throwing a single-season record seven go-ahead touchdown passes in the fourth quarter or overtime. He did it again Sunday, leading field goal drives to tie the game late in regulation and win it in OT. Smith finished 33 of 44 for 327 yards, a touchdown pass and no turnovers despite five drops and next to no help from his run game, which produced 46 yards. Early prediction for next week, the Seahawks will wear out the passing machines over the next few days in preparation to face the Dolphins. They had five drops against New England two apiece by DK Metcalf and Noah Fant plus another by Jackson Smith and Jigba. Fant's second drop came just outside the red zone on their second-to-last drive of regulation. Most surprising performance, wide receiver Jackson Smith and Jigba. He appeared poised for a breakout all offseason, and this was a matchup that seemed to suit him. But who saw this big of a day coming? Smith and Jigba's 12 catches for 117 yards on 16 targets were all career highs, easily topping his previous bests, 7 catches, 11 targets, 63 yards. Do the Patriots have a vulnerable pass defense? The Patriots' defense was impressive in Week 1 against the Bengals but sprang some leaks as QB Geno Smith finished 33 of 44 for 327 yards and one touchdown. Some credit should go to the Seahawks and their excellent WR core, but it wasn't without self-inflicted wounds, too. The one TD appeared to be a communication breakdown involving cornerback Christian Gonzalez and safety Kyle Duggar. There were also defensive pass interference penalties on CB's Marco Wilson and Jonathan Jones that led to a touchdown and the winning field goal in OT. The Patriots will have little time to recover with a Thursday night game against Aaron Rodgers and the Jets. Describe the game in two words, overtime heartbreaker. The Patriots played true to their identity in running for 185 yards and received the opening kickoff of overtime to give themselves a chance to win the game. In the end, their lack of explosiveness in the passing game and inconsistent pass defense were the difference. Biggest toll in the game plan, production from wide receivers in the passing game. Outside of rookie Jalen Polk's five-yard touchdown catch, a seven-yard poke catch late in the fourth quarter and a seven-yard catch by K.J. Osborne in overtime, the Patriots didn't have a wide receiver register another catch. That's likely a result of the Patriots running more two TE packages and TE Hunter Henry had a big day. Can QB Aaron Rodgers continue to bail out the Jets? Rodgers hit some clutch passes in the fourth quarter to save the Jets from a crushing loss and in 0-2 start going 5-4-5 on a 74-yard drive for the game-winning touchdown. 
Despite pedestrian numbers 18 of 30 for 176 yards Rodgers delivered when it mattered most and didn't turn the ball over, the reason the Jets traded for him last year. He brings the kind of winning mentality they've lacked for, well, decades. But it will be difficult to maintain unless the offense achieves more overall consistency. Biggest hole in the game plan, wide receiver Garrett Wilson was targeted only six times and had four receptions. Rodgers said he wanted to get Wilson more touches than last week, six, but they went in the wrong direction. He was covered a lot by cornerback Legarius Sneed, which was a factor, but there were ways, see, pre-snap motion, to create favorable matchups. Truth be told, Rodgers struggled to get the ball to every wide receiver. The passing attack was dink and dunk to the max Rodgers had to rely on his running backs, Brees Hall and Brylon Allen, both of whom caught touchdowns. Most surprising performance, defensive end Will McDonald 4. He had three sacks, equaling his career total. The biggest came with 23 seconds left, a third down play in the red zone. The former first-round pick came up huge on a day in which the Jets might have lost defensive end Jermaine Johnson to a season-ending Achilles injury which puts more pressure on the Jets to solve the Hasten Reddick holdout. How much our QB will leave us costly turnovers hurting the Titans? Levis single-handedly destroyed the Titans' momentum early in the game against the Jets. Tennessee was en route to consecutive scoring drives until Levis made a careless play that led to a turnover for the second week in a row. Levis tried to pitch the ball backward instead of taking a sack on third down, and instead, it was a fumble recovered by the Jets on their own 12-yard line. A score would have put the Titans up double digits. This comes a week after Tennessee wasn't able to recover from some devastating errors. Describe the game in two words, momentum swings. The momentum was swinging back and forth in this game. Levis' fumble and interception on consecutive drives gave the Jets life. The Titans fought back to tie it up, thanks to a miraculous touchdown catch by W.R. Calvin Ridley. In total, the Jets lost and regained the lead three times before coming up with the win. Most surprising performance, linebacker Harold Landry 3. He had two sacks against the Jets and now has a total of three after two games. Landry isn't normally a fast starter, as shown by his 3.5 total sacks through the first two games of his five previous seasons. The veteran outside linebacker is off to the best start of his career. What physical condition will the Vikings be in for Week 3? As exciting as Sunday's victory was, the Vikings were playing without most of their offensive playmakers by the end of the game. Wide receiver Justin Jefferson departed in the third quarter because of a right quad injury, while wideout Jordan Addison, ankle, was inactive and TJ Hawkinson, knee, was on the PUP list. Running back Aaron Jones, meanwhile, seemed slow in the fourth quarter after a trip to the blue tent. Unless there are some quick recoveries, the Vikings could be shorthanded heading into next Sunday's matchup against Houston. Describe the game in two words, Brian Flores. The Vikings defensive coordinator spun up a scheme that pressured QB Brock Purdy on 13 of his dropbacks and sacked him six times, which are both the most taken by Purdy in his career. The Vikings also intercepted him once and recovered his lone fumble. There will be plenty of adulation around the organization for this 2-0 start, but Flores has found ways to affect both victories via pass coverage and forced turnovers. Eye-popping advanced stat, Jefferson ran a total of 127.5 yards on a 97-yard touchdown reception in the second quarter, the most by a ball carrier on an offensive touchdown since 2016, according to NFL Next Gen Stats. Darnold sent the pass 50 yards in the air, but Jefferson had to stop after catching it, pivot and outrace G.I.R. Brown and George Odom to the far corner of the end zone for the score. Will the 49ers ever win in Minnesota again? No matter how good they have been, the Niners simply can't get it done in the Twin Cities. Sunday's loss was their eighth straight at Minnesota with their last win coming in 1992. This loss was more alarming for the fact that the Vikings were missing multiple key offensive players for most or all of the game and still rang up 407 total yards. Save for linebacker Fred Warner, the Niners have a lot of improvement to do defensively if they want to get back to the team they've been in recent years. Biggest hole in the game plan, it's no secret that Justin Jefferson is the best receiver in the league, and with Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson unavailable for Minnesota, it stood to reason the Niners would take special care to force anyone else to beat them. 
Instead, Jefferson posted four catches for 133 yards, including a 97-yard touchdown, before leaving with an injury. San Francisco wants to stick to its defensive principles of rushing four and playing zone coverage, but if the pass rush isn't getting home consistently, there has to be a better plan for players of Jefferson's caliber. Describe the game in two words, error-filled. Playing on the road and at 10 a.m. Pacific time for the first time this season, the Niners were seemingly sleepwalking for much of the game. It led to numerous costly mistakes, such as a blocked punt, a muffed punt and Purdy simply losing the ball for a fumble before he could throw it. In a place as difficult to win as Minnesota, that's not going to get it done. Are we looking at a career-best season for QB Baker Mayfield? Mayfield's five passing touchdowns, with a sixth on the ground, are the most ever for him over the first two games of a season. His ability to thrive under duress, he was sacked five times, and connect with wideout Chris Godwin who has amassed 200 receiving yards and two touchdowns through the first two games was the difference maker against the Lions. Biggest hole in the game plan, without starting right tackle Luke Godick, concussion, Lions defensive end Aiden Hutchinson dominated Tampa Bay's offensive line, registering 4.5 sacks. The Bucks had all week to prepare for the 2022 number 2 draft pick. While the first sack came on a stunt with DT Alan McNeil, Hutchinson just manhandled backup Justin Skill on the next two, and it wasn't until then that Skill got some help from another blocker. Even then, Hutchinson rattled off 1.5 more sacks. Most surprising performance, the Bucks battered secondary grabbed two takeaways off Lions QB Jared Goff without Antoine Winfield Jr. and Josh Hayes. Cornerback Zian McCollum, who just cleared the concussion protocol, secured his first career interception in the first quarter, which set up a 55-yard field goal. Backup safety slash nickelback Christian Izian picked off Goff in the fourth quarter and also made a touchdown-saving play against RB Jummer Gibbs. Safety Jordan Whitehead was a tackling machine and allowed only four catches on seven targets with a team-high three runstuffs. Both Izian and Whitehead tackled Gibbs on a critical fourth and eight at the Bucks' six-yard line with 101 left. Should the Lions be concerned about QB Jared Goff? Sunday wasn't his greatest performance. While Goff finished with 307 yards passing, he threw two costly interceptions, including a pick on Detroit's first defensive play of the game. He has now thrown an interception in each of the first two games of a season for just the second time in his career. On a day the Lions' offense recorded 463 yards, Goff's performance was a key factor in the loss. Most surprising performance, Hutchinson put together a sack hat trick in the opening quarter before ending with a career-high 4.5 sacks. It was the second most in a game by a Lions player since sacks became an official stat in 1982. Hutchinson was also the first player with three sacks in a quarter this NFL season and now has a sack in four consecutive games, tying the longest streak by a Lions player. Early prediction for next week, the Lions scored just one touchdown on seven red zone trips against the Buccaneers, which is uncharacteristic for an offense with so many weapons. Detroit will need to clean up its mistakes entering next week's matchup in Arizona. Can the Packers win again without QB Jordan Love? Considering they're playing yet another offensively challenged AFC South team in the Titans next week, why not? While it sounded like Love was close to being able to play against the Colts, the Packers may want to buy another week of recovery now that they have at least one win without him. And 0-3 start would have been tough but not impossible to overcome and a loss might have forced the Packers to push Love to play. But at 1-1 early in a 17-game schedule, they can better afford to roll the dice with Malik Willis and another run-heavy game plan. Describe the game in two words, run over. The Packers barely even pretended to throw the ball in the first half. Willis threw just five times compared to 34 rushing attempts for the Packers before halftime. In just his second game with the Packers, Josh Jacobs carried 32 times for 151 yards. Willis was effective when he was asked to throw and finished 12 of 14 for 122 yards and a touchdown. Eye-popping advanced stat, the Packers' 237 yards rushing in the first half was the third most by an NFL team in the first half of a game since 2000. It was 14 behind the most, which was by the Jaguars in 2006 also against the Colts. In all, the Packers rushed 53 times for 261 yards. What happened to the Colts' run defense? For the second week in a row, the Colts were physically dominated up front by an opponent's running game. 
The Packers posted historic first-half rushing totals with 237 yards. And while the Colts got the rushing attack under control in the second half, the Packers still managed to convert some critical third downs. Green Bay also beat the Colts with great use of misdirection, using Indianapolis aggressiveness against it. The Colts have now allowed 405 rushing yards this season. Biggest hole in the game plan, quarterback Anthony Richardson was the Colts' leading rusher with six carries for 56 yards in Week 1. But the Colts were seemingly disinterested in using Richardson on design runs Sunday, opting to keep him in the pocket even though the Packers' coverages were intent on not allowing him to throw downfield. Richardson had one design run Sunday after several were called in Week 1. Most surprising performance, rookie receiver Adonai Mitchell had a promising training camp and has created much optimism, but he hurt the Colts on Sunday with a critical pair of plays. Mitchell committed a mental error with an illegal formation penalty in the second quarter, negating a huge third-down conversion. Later, Mitchell dropped a perfect pass from Richardson that would have converted a critical third down during the Colts' failed comeback. Mitchell saw fewer snaps the rest of the game, perhaps as a result. Can the Saints keep up this offensive pace? The Saints proved their new offense is for real after blowing out both the Panthers and Cowboys. But how long can they keep up this record-setting pace? The Saints' starting offense scored on its first 16 possessions of the season, gave running back Alvin Kamara his second career four-touchdown game and looked unstoppable. The Saints did not stall on a possession until a Derek Carr interception in the fourth quarter. Describe the game in two words, master performance. It's hard to take issue with anything Carr or the offense did against the Cowboys. They set the tone early and never let off the gas, using Rashid Shahid's speed and Kamara's versatility while deploying multiple players as blockers to allow Carr to play mostly error-free. Eye-popping advanced stat, 91 points. The Saints made a big move this offseason by moving away from the Sean Payton offense that won a Super Bowl title in the 2009 season. That team put up 93 points in its first two games, the second most in NFL history. This season Saints are tied for sixth in NFL history with 91 points through Week 2. What should be made of the Cowboys' defense? Dominant against the Browns. Dominated by the Saints. Through three quarters, the Saints averaged 9.7 yards per play. The 35 points allowed in the first half tied for the most given up through the first two quarters in team history. Last year, the Cowboys allowed more than 35 points in a game just once. Carr was hardly touched and neither was Kamara, who had four touchdowns. Mike McCarthy was around for the last time an opponent had four touchdowns against Dallas with Packers running back Aaron Jones scoring four in a Green Bay win at at and Stadium. Early prediction for next week, it's not going to get any easier. The Ravens have historically been one of the better rushing teams in the NFL, in part because quarterback Lamar Jackson is a game-changer. He can make defenses look bad on his own. Derrick Henry has yet to go off in his first two games with the Ravens, but the Cowboys were bludgeoned by the Saints in every way, giving up more than five yards per carry on their first six possessions. Describe the game in two words, over early. This wasn't as bad as the 48-32 wildcard loss to the Packers last season, but only because this wasn't a playoff loss. The Cowboys allowed touchdowns on the Saints' first six possessions. The offense moved the ball but failed on two red zone trips, settling for too many Brandon Aubrey field goals. Should the Chargers stop splitting carries between Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins? Dobbins had another record-setting Sunday, finishing with 17 carries for 131 yards and one touchdown. Dobbins is the first Chargers player to rush for 100 yards in each of his team's first two games of a season, and he somersaulted into the end zone for his lone score of the day. Offensive coordinator Greg Roman said they would roll with the hot hand as the season progressed, but it's clear that the rushing offense is better with Dobbins. Edwards had 18 carries for 59 yards. Most surprising performance, Quinton Johnston's two touchdowns, Johnston had scored two touchdowns over the first 18 games of his career before he caught two in the first half on Sunday. Johnston's first score, a 29-yard catch over CB J.C. Horn, was his most impressive play of the day. Johnston ran by Horn and adjusted as the ball was in the air to reel in the pass for the score. Describe the game in two words, defensive domination. The Chargers held Panthers quarterback Bryce Young to just 22 passing yards in the first half, the lowest first-half total of his career. 
The Chargers' defense has allowed just 13 points over the first two weeks of the season. When will coach Dave Canales sit quarterback Bryce Young? Carolina has way more problems than Young, but slow starts are killing the Panthers. Young is a factor. He was 8 of 10 for 22 yards and a pick in the first half Sunday. He was 6 of 12 for 50 yards with a pick in the first half last week. Andy Dalton might give Carolina a better chance. But when recently asked about changing, Canales said, the best experience you can have is to be on the field and just to live it. Describe the game in two words, deja vu. The 20-0 first-half deficit looked eerily similar to last week when they fell behind 30-3 against New Orleans. The inability to stop the run against the Chargers, 44 rushes for 219 yards, mirrored the inability to stop it against the Saints, 180 yards. Young's ineffectiveness, yes, a lot of bad similarities. Early prediction for next week, Canales will take a chance by switching to Dalton either before Sunday's game at Las Vegas or during it. It was this time last season that Young sat because of an ankle injury, and the Panthers had their best offensive output. What does the future hold at linebacker? Terrell Bernard left the game in the first half with a pectoral injury, meaning both of the team's starting linebackers are injured, in addition to starting nickel cornerback Taryn Johnson. Balen Spector played the rest of the game for Bernard, while Dorian Williams is in for the injured Matt Milano. With Bernard set to miss time the team is deciding whether to place him on injured reserve a position that has dealt with injuries since the offseason will have to overcome even more, with coach Sean McDermott anticipating Spectre taking over the middle linebacker role in Bernard's absence. Eye-popping advanced stat, on quarterback Josh Allen's throw to running back Ty Johnson that set up James Cook's one-yard touchdown run, Allen was running 14.87 miles per hour at the time of his throw. In the past five seasons, Allen has completed 50 passes on 113 attempts when running at least 14 miles per hour. That is the most such completions in the NFL over that span. Eagles quarterback Jalen Hurts is next with 40. Most surprising performance, cornerback Jamarcus Ingram. The former undrafted free agent took advantage of opportunities and came away with two interceptions, including a pick six. Ingram came into the game without ever recording an interception. What will the Dolphins do at quarterback moving forward? Tua Tagovailoa's latest concussion will likely keep him out of next week's game against the Seahawks, coach Mike McDaniel said. The Dolphins have the utmost confidence in third-year quarterback Skylar Thompson, who will in all likelihood start until Tagovailoa is able to return. McDaniel said Miami will add another quarterback to its roster, but don't expect a player like Ryan Tannehill or Jimmy Garoppolo, who would come in expecting to start. Most surprising performance, the Dolphins' performance as a whole was surprising, but individually, Tyreek Hill recorded just three catches for 24 yards. Jalen Waddell, Jonna Smith and Devonna Chain were all more productive as Hill's struggles against the Bills continue. If Thompson is to start next week, Hill has to assert himself as one of the league's best players regardless of his team's quarterback situation. Eye-popping advanced stat, according to NFL Next Gen Stats, Tago Bailoa completed only two of his eight attempts of 10-plus air yards, resulting in 38 yards and two interceptions. It was the lowest completion percentage of his career in games where he's attempted at least eight such passes. Considering the Bills' unproven safeties, not being able to take advantage of that matchup was a huge miss for Miami's offense. Goff was extended in May and given $113 million in fully guaranteed money and $53 million on average per year, which puts him in the top 10 of quarterback contracts in those categories. But his contract does not include an insurance addendum, and if the team purchased insurance outside of the contract, any claim would not count toward cap relief. Buffum works for the agency that represents Goff, and he said the Lions discussed insuring Goff's extension during negotiations this spring. Among the other uninsured quarterback contracts are all nine starters on rookie contracts, less likely to be insured because the deals are lower value, bridge quarterbacks on cheap contracts, Sam Darnold, Gardner Minshew, Russell Wilson making the veteran minimum in Pittsburgh, Denver insured his contract previously, and the remaining middle-of-the-market quarterback deals, Daniel Jones, Matthew Stafford, Derek Carr, Baker Mayfield, Geno Smith. And then there's Rodgers. According to an insurance industry source, the Jets never returned calls from multiple insurance brokers, including the one who wrote and sold the Packers their policy on Rodgers. 
The Jets could have negotiated the existing Rogers policy to ensure a reduced portion of the signing bonus, but instead they let the policy go. Joe Douglas was hired in 2019 as the Jets general manager from his role as vice president of player personnel for the Eagles, a team that deals in insurance policies more than any other club. But the insurance decision may not have been his to make. Former Jets general manager John Inzik, speaking generally about the five clubs he worked for in his NFL career, told ESPN that ownership approval and buy-in is necessary to purchase an insurance premium. At the ownership level, there's a certain way of conducting business, Idzik said. Some clubs will be more apt to insure and they get used to that, and they see the benefits of it. Others are less apartment. A club's philosophy on insurance can be influenced by its salary cap staff's analysis, but it's ultimately determined by the owner, who has to be willing to spend their own money on the premium. The NFL doesn't require clubs to purchase these temporary total disability policies on player contracts, so it's up to each owner to value what Buffum calls a lose-small, win-big proposition. It's whether or not they're believers in insurance, whether they want to spend the money on it or not, an industry source said. Sportico reported the Jets haven't done a policy in at least 10 years. Idzik declined to say whether they'd purchased insurance in his two seasons, 2013-14, as Jets GM. It was under discussion any time we had a big contract, he said. The Jets declined to comment through a team spokesperson. Among the other teams that industry sources said don't buy insurance, or have simply opted against it to date, are the Bears, Colts, Panthers, and Steelers. Spokespeople for the Bears and Colts confirmed they have not purchased policies up to this point, though both said their teams do assess the possibility of utilizing this tool. The Panthers confirmed they have not purchased a policy. The Steelers declined to comment. For the most part, owners who don't buy insurance think the cost of the premium isn't worth spending on a claim unlikely to fully pay out, according to a former CAP executive. He said he had done due diligence on insurance policies and presented the information to three different owners for whom he worked, including one who was specifically interested after noticing Eagles owner Jeffrey Lurie buying a lot of insurance. But all three thought the premiums were too high. One club executive estimated the cost of a premium has increased around 30% to 40% in the past five years. Per insurance industry sources, if a club wanted to insure $40 or $50 million of a contract, it would cost them somewhere between $1 or $2 million per year. That club executive said his team is only buying insurance now because of the cap credit. The Eagles must lead the league in this advanced stat using insurance addendums as a guide. The club has insurance policies on at least 16 players for 2024. Philadelphia's portfolio is the stuff of legend among salary cap staff and those in the insurance business because of the sheer number of policies it buys and the range of contract values insured. An industry source said the majority of teams set a threshold to determine the size of the contract they'll insure, like $40 million guaranteed, and then buy insurance on any contract over that number. That is not what the Eagles do. They've got the usual high rollers. Quarterback Jalen Hurts' contract is insured for $63.75 million for 2024, out of the $110 million guaranteed in his deal, and receiver A.J. Brown's contract is insured for $29.8 million for 2024, out of the $51 million guaranteed in his deal. But they also insure three players on rookie contracts for small sums between $750,000 and $2.5 million for 2024, one of whom, center Cam Jurgens, has $3.9 million in guaranteed money. I have no clue what the background is on why they do what they do, said another insurance industry source familiar with the Eagles' insurance buying habits. He laughed, I have no clue. Through an Eagles spokesperson, executive vice president and general manager Howie Roseman said he appreciated the interest in his strategy but declined to comment. One executive for another club described Philadelphia's tendencies as spreading risk around by insuring a variety of players for a range of amounts. The amount a club insures a contract for has to be written into the player's contract in order for the club to qualify for cap relief, so the Eagles' portfolio is there for all the league to track. Clubs aren't required to file insurance policies to the league office or the NFLPA, so there's no comprehensive database of each team's policies, how much their premiums cost or how much they received in collections for the length of an injury. The existence of an insurance addendum in a player's contract is the best way to track insurance usage, but it's not foolproof.
A team could add an insurance addendum to a contract and then decide to not purchase the policy or to stop paying for the policy in a later year. Buffum said when he worked for the 49ers from 2014 to 2022, the Niners discussed buying a policy for almost any non-minimum extension, and most of the time, the decision was yes. The team insured three players who missed a significant amount of time due to injury in 2020, Jimmy Garoppolo, 10 games, D. Ford, 15 games, and George Kittle, 8 games. Garoppolo's contract insurance language said the team insured up to $15 million, but it did not specify for which years, it was likely for less than that amount in 2020 because he was in year three of his deal, and Ford's playing contract specified up to $8 million of his regular season salary for that year. It was just a windfall of insurance that year, Buffum said. Each policy is different based on the player's position, age, injury history, and career trajectory. Clubs can choose from a range of deductibles and wait time some expensive policies start paying cash to clubs after just one game missed, other more affordable policies don't pay until the eighth consecutive game missed. The Niners declined to comment on the amount of insurance proceeds they received that season, but roster management system reports San Francisco earned $11.2 million in end-of-year cap adjustments, a sum that includes insurance credit, along with other forms of credit or expenses, such as unearned incentives. For the 2021 season, San Francisco's adjustment was $5.5 million more than the second-place team. The cap decreased by $15.7 million that year because of the 2020 COVID season losses, and no team besides the 49ers was even close to making up that gap. The cap went down for the first time ever, Buffum said. And it aided our ability to keep our team intact. The Niners' 10-year total in end-of-year adjustments is $54.3 million, double the second-place team's total. This number isn't only insurance credit, but representative of other savvy cap hacks that benefit teams when players get hurt, such as paying salary in the form of per-game roster bonuses. Philadelphia's $19.1 million over 10 years is good for sixth. This season, the 49ers have already put running back Christian McCaffrey on injured reserve, meaning he will miss at least five games. Per his playing contract, the team has insured McCaffrey for up to $15 million for 2024. Just like with home and auto, NFL clubs can save money on premiums by bundling policies, so it can make sense financially to do a few at once. The Giants, who have insured very few players in the past, renegotiated the contracts of pass rushers Dexter Lawrence II and Brian Burns and left tackle Andrew Thomas this offseason to add insurance addendums for $10 million for the 2024 season. There are some teams that are doing more insurance than they've ever done before outside of quarterbacks, a former NFL club executive said. And that reality, that more clubs are viewing insurance as a team-building advantage, is why the future of the loophole could be in jeopardy. For sources, from the insurance industry, the NFLPA and NFL clubs told ESPN that over the course of the past year, they've heard that the NFL Management Council, which runs point on salary cap and contract matters, has been discussing eliminating the cap relief benefit to teams. One insurance industry source said the reason the management council started talking about it is because they think it isn't fair to small market and family-owned teams that have less cash available to spend. A club executive said he thinks the league wants to have more control over it. A league source said that the management council has not discussed a change to this rule with the NFLPA. The NFL declined to comment. To remove the cap relief for insurance claims would require a revision to the CBA which would also require the NFLPA sign-off. This seems unlikely because that would eliminate money in cap room that goes directly to player salaries. ESPN spoke to an NFL owner who regularly buys policies. This owner hadn't heard that insurance cap relief could be at risk but said their team would have something to say about it. If that's true, the owner said, that would not be good. At all. Of the seven quarterbacks lost to season-ending injuries in 2023, at least four teams didn't collect any insurance payout or cap relief because they didn't insure the contract for 2023, Rodgers, 16 games missed, Colts rookie Anthony Richardson, 15 games, Jones, 11 games, and Kirk Cousins, 9 games the Vikings previously insured his contract, but only through the end of the 2022 regular season. The Browns, Deshaun Watson, 11 games missed, Bengals, Joe Burrow, 7 games, and Chargers, Justin Herbert, 4 games, each insured a portion of their quarterback's contracts, and the NFLPA said both the Browns and Bengals received cap credit because of it.
Per roster management system, the Browns received $4.1 million in end-of-year cap adjustments for 2024, while the Bengals received $688,267. The NFLPA said the Cardinals also received insurance credit for Kyler Murray's ACL injury that kept him out for 15 games last season, and Arizona finished with $5 million in end-of-year cap adjustments. The first hold-your-breath a franchise quarterback is hurt moment happened in Week 1, when Luff was brought down by two Eagles defenders late in the game in Sao Paulo. He needed help to walk off the field. It happened again in Week 2, when Tagovailoa left the game with a concussion. Tago Bailoa will miss at least four games after being placed on injured reserve Tuesday. The news for Love was better than expected. An MCL sprain, not an ACL tear. Green Bay hasn't placed Love on injured reserve, but the team is prepared for the worst. Green Bay is a longtime insurance customer. Love's contract is covered for up to $74.8 million for 2024.